you know, this is good. Ah! Just tell me what you mean. Don't say that there is a distinction and don't explain what it is. I, did I mention I'm going to be ranting? I'm going to be ranting a little. Welcome back to uh, Different Atheist Reads A History of God by Karen Armstrong. I'm Christy and thanks for joining me. We are finally into the actual book itself. In this video, I will present Kara's view, but I also want to apply some of the attributes, the attributes that we found in the last video, and we get our first opportunity to do that right away in the introduction. What Karen does, I think, is kind of set it up in two different sections. The first one is basically an autobiography, a little bit of background about where Karen is coming from. She starts off by talking about her childhood beliefs, and I'll try not to read too much of the book directly, rather than I will try to paraphrase, but I also sometimes think it's important to get her words right because I will want to refer to them in my own critique of her work. As a child, I had a number of strong religious beliefs, but little faith in God. There is a distinction between belief in a set of propositions and a faith which enables us to put our trust in them. She then talks about how she believed in God and the sacraments and the presence of Christ and, and so on, but she didn't necessarily have a connection, I think is what she's trying to say, with those beliefs. And I think that if we look at the concepts, um, or the attributes, I should say, that we picked out for God in the last video, this would be one of transcendence. This wouldn't be um, uh, Karen's reporting her feeling of God as being quite distant and not a personal God. She goes on to say, and I can understand this having myself grown up Catholic, that the Roman Catholicism of my childhood was a rather frightening creed. In fact, hell seemed a more potent reality than God, because it was something that I could grasp imaginatively. God, on the other hand, was a somewhat shadowy figure, defined in intellectual abstractions rather than images. And here, again, we can use the attributes of the last time that let's call it God's mercilessness, uh, God's not showing mercy and providing hell and eternal damnation is an aspect that she's connecting with God and the transcendence of God. So this can be understood quite easily from why she would be feeling alienated from something that she could more easily empathize with in terms of pain and suffering than in terms of connection and love. She then uh, compares this to her a more mature development of religious understanding when she leaves and becomes a nun. Uh, she studies and discovers that there's more to her religion than fear and she was able to be moved, be moved by the beauty that she found in the liturgy. She thought that there was a connection there that it made would transfigure the whole of created reality. As Karen Armstrong matured in her faith, she still felt that absence of personal presence that she reports feeling that God was always very distant from distant from her. He was also quite a taskmaster, making sure that she was doing things correctly and notice, noticing when she did not. And she reports that nothing had actually happened to her from a source beyond herself. She never glimpsed, as she says, the God described by the prophets and the mystics. So again, we have this discussion of transcendence. God is being very distant from human beings that she feels there's a distance also, that, that God is purity and she is pr profanity, again, the sort of spiritual imperfection. And I also want to put in a new contribution that we see in the story in terms of how people present their notions of God, and that is God is a personal inspiration versus an external inspiration. Here you can see Karen is looking for God to be external and come in and, and to inspire her. And once she, as she reports, she leaves the church and leaves all the doctrine, doctrines, she is then free um, of those beliefs of God in terms of a religious structure. But when she goes and continues her research into religious beliefs, she starts to discover people who tell her that God is not something that is external. You have to create it yourself, like poetry or art. And she says, the more I learned about the history of religion, the more my earlier misgivings were justified. The doctrines I had accepted without question as a child were indeed man-made, constructed over a long period of time. This then allows her to move on and start to see God rather as a fixed point that has been presented by religion that you must accept, and rather as a more organic process that people have to go through. 
She says, My early confused ideas about God had not been modified or developed. People without my peculiar religious background may also find that their notion of God was formed in infancy. Since those days, we have put away childish things and have discarded the God of our first years. In this, Karen is saying that when we are presented with the God as a child, that's not going to withstand deeper scrutiny through adulthood, and that is why we, she feels that the, the God that you create as an adult is probably um, more personal. Now, confusingly, the story kind of abruptly ends there, and we don't really get the end of the story. She starts then to move into how her own religious um, faith was impacted by her explorations in terms of the history of religion, and then she turns into what I would say is the second part of the introduction. That's a bit more about pointing toward where the book would be going. And she says that she discovered on her religious quest or her investigations of religion throughout history, and I will quote here here, there's a case for arguing that homo sapiens is also homo, however you pronounce that. Men and women started to worship gods as soon as they became recognizably human. They created religions at the same time as they created works of art. This was not simply because they wanted to propitiate powerful forces, but these early faiths expressed the wonder and mystery that always seemed to have been an essential component of the human experience of this beautiful yet terrifying world. Like art, religion has been an attempt to find meaning and value in life, despite the suffering that flesh is heir to. We see here how Karen's own more mature and developed worldview is now being presented to give us a signpost as to uh, where we will be going as, as we follow through her book. And I think understanding that this is the view that she is going to be taking when she interprets the, her history of God as she is presenting it, this again is, is quite important. She also would say that even modern society, things that we would not necessarily be considered religious, she would consider religious or spiritual. I think it's also important here to clarify something um, about how she sees humanism and how she sees atheism. And I will again quote her directly. Humanism is itself a religion without God. Not all religions, of course, are theistic. Our ethical, secular ideal has its own disciplines of mind and heart and gives people the means of finding faith in the ultimate meaning of human life that were once provided by more conventional religions. So for Armstrong, it seems that humanism, or really anything that provides a set of ideals or ideas that will facilitate people's experience, especially of faith, and I'm not sure she's discussing that in terms of faith like she mentioned in her opening lines or not, but in this ultimate meaning of life, it serves the same purpose for providing emotional experiences as traditional religion, even if it's for a modern age. In the last section, what Karen does is to point a little bit forward to where the book is going by again referring to her own experience. She talks about how she, when she went looking for God, she thought that she would find that God had been a projection of human needs and desires, that he would mirror human feelings and yearnings depending on the development of the society at the time. She said that wasn't an unjustified prediction, but she said she'd be she was extremely surprised by some of her own findings. And what were these findings? Uh, she doesn't really say. Um, she basically makes some refer references back to her own experience, saying that it would have saved her a lot of anxiety to hear from people that, that instead of waiting for God to descend from on high externally and come down and you know, sort of bless her, and all of a sudden these feelings would come inside, that God was something she had to participate in creating herself, that, as she said here, they would have told me that in an important sense, God was a product of the creative imagination, like the poetry and music I found so inspiring. A few highly respected monotheists would have told me quietly and firmly that God did not really exist, and yet that he was the most important reality in the world. All right, so that's pretty provocative, um, especially if you're coming at this from a rather traditional point of view. She doesn't, again, really clarify, I guess in her mind maybe she thinks that these are the findings that she has presented and this is quite astonishing, but it, I, and as a reader, that could have been, well, I don't want to do too much of a critique here, but I, I want to point that out because I think that that's actually her point and I missed it the first couple times I read through it. And then she does point the way forward somewhat in terms of where the book will be going, because she 
says what the book is kind of not, rather than saying precisely what it is. This book will not be a history of the ineffable reality of God itself, which is beyond time and change, but a history of the way men and women have perceived him from Abraham to the present day. That's basically the history that she will be presenting in the course of her book. And then the last thing I want to touch upon in terms of Karen's work is her critique, or feminist critique that she brings to it, and I do think that this is going to be important as we move forward, so I want to raise it now. This brings me to a difficult point. Because this god began as a specifically male deity, monotheists have usually referred to it as he. In recent years, feminists have understandably objected to this. Since I shall be recording the thoughts and insights of people who called God he, I have used the conventional masculine terminology, except when it has been more appropriate. To sum up, Karen Armstrong uh, presented a, a, sem a semi-autobiography in terms of her own experience. We used the concepts, uh, a concept of God that she had by identifying the attributes that we set up in the previous video to compare her more transcendent view of God. And then at the end, what we see is really a very personal, almost a personally generated experience of God that is very different from the approaches she was given as, as a teenager. We also see that she has a very expansive view of what it means to be a religion and be a religious person. She sees humanism as an aspect of religion. She also sees atheism as a portion of religion. And finally, her book is going to be not looking at a fixed point of a reality of God that tracks through time. Rather, she wants to investigate the ineffable expressions of God humans have attempted as they have moved through time. I will present my counter arguments or my critiques of the introduction in the next video. And then I will probably have a couple rants that I want to just get off my chest and out of the way. But once the rants are over, uh, I'll try not to have them again and again and again. There are things about the book that I really like, but there are some things that I do want to say as we move forward. This has been A Different Atheist Reads. Thanks for watching. They would have told me that in an important sense, <laughs>